A vision of delight devolves into a nightmare. Hieronymus Bosch painted this triptych around 1500. In three panels, he took us from the Garden of Eden to hell with this guy. I mean, who is this guy? What does he represent? Each panel has its own modern title. The main centre panel is called the Garden of Earthly Delights, a name which also serves to describe the entire work. Let's quickly look at each panel. The left panel is titled The Garden of Eden. It looks idyllic, mostly. The main middle panel, The Garden of Earthly Delights, takes us forward from the garden into humanity in full swing, doing all kinds of things in the full glow of the day, the prime of life. But plenty of weird things going on. More on that soon. On the right, the last panel is titled The Hell, the judgment of sinners in a nightmarish dreamscape, looking like a drug-induced trip resulting from some particularly bad acid. We'll come to that last. The three panels were joined together, the outer two folding over to cover the main painting. On the reverse of the two panels is an earlier point in the creation of the world, God looking on as plants and vegetation are created, but mankind still in the future, a future that will be revealed when the panels are opened. A triptych would often serve as a feature of the altar of a church. But the excessive nudity and other weird events make this less likely. Although I've seen some pretty bizarre and unsettling art in medieval churches around Europe. For example, this is from the interior of the dome of the Duomo Cathedral in Florence. Religious paintings from this time were often Bible stories or church traditions. The Stations of the Cross, Christ on the Cross, events from the Gospels, parables and so on. Many could not read. Bibles were costly and in short supply, and in any case in Latin. The people had to rely on the words from the pulpit and the religious art that adorned the inside of churches. A priest seeking to maintain power might dwell on certain parts of scripture, or leave that altogether and teach various church traditions, dwelling on the suffering of saints and the piety of those who did as they were told. It's unfashionable now to call these times the Dark Ages. Bosch was painting at the end of the medieval period, just as the Renaissance was beginning, and his paintings are part of the last hurrah of the Dark Ages. Hieronymus Bosch was a painter of his time, but was not portraying any reality he could have seen. Apart from the messages he was working into the paintings, many of the elements included bring us forward 400 years to the Surrealism movement in art. This may contribute to the current popularity of his works. If nothing else, they provide a fascinating insight into the medieval worldview. There is a story here, a story of beginnings, idyllic innocence, loss of innocence after the fall, and the medieval view of the consequences. Apart from God's presence before mankind and in the garden, he is conspicuously absent from the other two panels. No redemptive story, no hope for fallen mankind. Just make hay while the sun shines because all too soon you'll be among the teeming millions in a medieval hellscape. It's the hands-off view of God, the one who winds the universe up, sets mankind in it, and then leaves them to their own devices until catching them at death. There is another reason why I don't think this was a church altarpiece. While the story of the fall and the terrible consequences outlined here would have been good for instilling fear, the complete absence of any redemptive message, not even a cross somewhere, marked this out as Bosch leaving out any real attempt at a Christian message, rather using this story as a pretty thin covering for letting loose with his own jaded view of humanity. Because Bosch's humanity is... Uh, look, I'll come to that when we look at the middle panel. Let's look at each panel in detail in turn. In the foreground, our three protagonists appear. God fully clothed, as is appropriate, I suppose, but this must have been confusing for the other two. Adam is pretty chilled out, sitting near the shade of his favourite tree, 
and used to being in the presence of God. He feels no need to jump to his feet. He is so comfortable in his relationship with God that his toes touch God's robes. Around him are various animals and trees. The whole scene is idyllic, but there's someone new here. Eve has just been created for Adam. God has taken her wrist and is presenting her to Adam, who is certainly showing attention. Eve is more demure, her eyes down. The point of this panel is to introduce how things should be. Idyllic, simple, all in the presence and blessing of God. As our eyes start to roam over the rest of the panel, we see things we might expect. Elephants, giraffes, a bit weird, but he may not have seen a real one. Unicorns, birds, gazelles, monkeys. In the pond is the original water feature, providing fresh water to the birds. But there are some unexpected items too. Animals eating other animals. A three-headed bird. A half fish, half animal sitting in the pool reading a book. Far in the distance, birds circle a hut-like structure, while the hills and mountains seem to be sewn together by strange plants and dead branches. Not all of the animals are recognisable, and not all are acting peacefully. Perhaps this is to portray Adam in his innocence, before he had the knowledge of good and evil. Perhaps Bosch just had some flights of fancy to fill out the rest of the panel. In Bosch's view, it seems that one of the main delights of earthly existence is cavorting around naked. While Adam and Eve were naked in their innocence, humanity now in full swing is, well, in full swing. From the front, there is a good selection of people, berries, birds and flowers. People are being born fully formed from eggs or flower buds. There's a lot of interaction and the exploration of the purposes of bodies. Using someone as a vase, not something I had on my bucket list as images I couldn't wait to see. Bosch's humanity is earthly. There is no higher spirit exhibited within mankind. They are born out of the flowering of plants, sometimes have a berry for a head, swim with berries, cavort with each other, in one scene picking apples as if to say, well, we've just partaken of the forbidden fruit now, let's just keep eating. Dancing with birds, offering berries to birds, cavorting with animals, becoming animals. If there is any message at all, it is that having left the garden, their capacity to live on any kind of higher spiritual plane has dissolved, leaving only sensual fulfilment on their way to the grave. There is little sense of a society, no inkling of care for each other, no wisdom, no invention just relentless, heady pursuit of a good time. Maybe Bosch sees more of us than we care to admit, even to ourselves. The middle ground of this panel features a circular race. A pool full of young maidens, their hair flowing down, is surrounded by a procession of men showing off their physical prowess, indulging in various acts of strength and weirdness. Here's three guys on horses, maybe, carrying a fish, which is eating another fish. A chorus of very large birds looks on, while men and women interact with them in strange ways. Up the top, the buildings of men are formed from the organic ground, providing no real shelter, more as monuments to themselves, another insight into the human condition, I think. There are no children and no old people. Everyone is in the prime of life, but while their life on one level seems to be a giant party, the overarching sense is one of meaninglessness, of a headlong rush to suck everything out of life before it ends. Bosch would have been aware of the words of King Solomon, a man has no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry, for that shall abide with him of his labour the days of his life, which God gives him under the sun. And then, just like that, your time under the sun is over, and we turn to the final panel. Again, there is no redemptive story here. Unlike, say, the Sistine Chapel, where we see Christ bringing souls into heaven while others are consigned downward, 
This panel is just all bad news. Not a single person is having a good time. It's not just the various tortures, but the overall feeling of confusion and darkness which reigns. A pig wearing a nun's veil kisses a man who avoids its snout. A card table, gambling was frowned upon, is thrown over. Around 60 years later, Brugel the Elder painted The Triumph of Death, also featuring a thrown over gaming table. People are shown vomiting and excreting into a hole. You think to yourself they're pretty miserable, until you realise that the hole itself is also populated by denizens who are even more wretched. Above the cesspit, a human-like creature with the head of a bird eats people as birds escape from them, defecating them also into the pit below. This painting is not for the faint-hearted. Above all this, we see various musical instruments not being used to create music, that would be far too nice, but rather as devices for inflicting pain. There are sounds, but they are such to make one cover one's ears. Musical notes become tattooed on buttocks, a strange snake-headed monster following along with his tongue. While there is the heat of furnaces here, just above the instruments is ice, where cold, naked, hapless men try to skate, falling in, while above them others are feasted upon. Parts of bodies are draped over a knife and others are ridden upon. A monk-like man reads from a book, the scriptures maybe, but this only serves to become a dead weight, pressing down on the man below him. A creature pulls a man onto a ladder, the one before him already suffering an unpleasant fate. Rising above all this, two limbs like tree trunks support a hollowed out man, his body in the shape of an egg, his insides the prison of yet more hapless souls. The tree man looks back at us. His hat serves as an endless circle around which beasts lead men on an endless merry-go-round, their ears blasted by an organic bagpipe. Who is this man? There are plenty of ideas. Is the face the artist himself? Some think so. But what could he possibly represent? His limbs, his tree trunk limbs, don't grow out of the ground. They are balanced on two boats, still afloat on the cold water. Rather than being anchored in the solid earth, he balances above the frozen water on the flimsy inventions of mankind. He recognises his role in hell. It is to bear witness, to look. He looks at us. In the entire three panels, only one other figure clearly looks at us, and that is God in the first panel. His eyes look up at us as if to say, I'm trying to warn you. And here in hell, the main figure knowingly looks our way. Were you not warned? You made merry with music and now it has become your torturer. You played your games and now you're sinking. You eat and now you are being eaten. Your buildings are on fire. Your life's work has come to nothing. He is the watcher watching us, reminding us that all along you are headed here. Again, King Solomon's words may have coloured Bosch's view. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no work nor device nor knowledge nor wisdom in the grave where you're going. A fractured knife splits two ears that do not have a head, while to their left a man descends by ladder into a fiery pit, being nudged along by a demonic figure. And as we pan out towards the top, in the distance, we see thousands, a sea of misery, all waiting their turn to partake in the never-ending torments lined up for them. Finally, the kingdoms of men, ablaze, provide a mechanism for the death that precedes each sinner's entrance into the hell. Armies being led, boating accidents, fires, falls, more soldiers, leaving behind the light of the natural world with its trees silhouetted, legions of people on their way out of normal life, leading them to plunge into the horrors below. Taken as a whole, well, well, you can't take it as a whole. It's too much to take in at once. The excessive detail expands wherever you look. Instead, we are left only with an impression. This is not a place to go. 
Everywhere there are people in states of misery, pain, confusion and despair. Feeling happy? I don't think that was the artist's intention at any level. The overarching message is not of hope, but of despair, perplexity. We are all caught on the merry-go-round and one day the music will stop. It's not surprising that eventually people rebelled against this view. And one way of looking at this is that Bosch himself is rebelling against the use of fear as a means of control. Perhaps he is saying to the people of his time that if you think this is the whole story, just for a moment consider how limited you have become, how caught up in the merry-go-round of everyday life, but also how caught up in heading towards a hell that is described by your leaders as the price of not listening to them. Actually, it's surreal. This cannot be the whole story. Surely there is something more. But while an artist may point out the folly of our worldview, it is not the role of the artist to always give the answer. Great art, art that keeps ticking over in our minds long after we have seen it, doesn't usually wave its whole message in our faces. If all the thinking is done for us already, no need for us to think any further. So sure, maybe Bosch is just giving us a morality tale. Or maybe he's saying, really? You really think this is the whole story? What do you think? Well, that was a harrowing journey and you made it to the end. Well done. This kind of art does not use a single clear scene with a focal point to draw us in. Rather, it's a, it's a collection of items over which our eyes must roam, never finding a point on which to rest. But an artist from 500 years ago is trying to tell us something. I've seen this painting. I, I waited in a massive queue to get too short a time in front of it. It's stunning, unsettling, beautiful and horrifying. It breathes still of Bosch's search for meaning. Anyway, that's my reaction. If you want more, you know what to do. Like and subscribe. See you next time.